Did I not get the word that class is canceled today? <laughs> I mean, it's cold out, I know, and there's snow, but... Oh, well. I'd like to start out by asking if there are any pressing questions. Let me sort of give you the impression of where the class, where I think the class is at. Okay, and then you can confirm or deny. I have a feeling that the class is pretty comfortable with the basic stuff that we've been doing, that is being able to create models, create the database from the model, scaffold it, make some modifications to the basic pages, and come up with some very, you know, come up with um, pages that allow you to insert, update, delete, do searches, all those sorts of things. I have a feeling you're pretty comfortable with the basic functionality we've been doing up to this point. But, as far as looking forward to the project, there might be some things that you have in mind for your project that may or may not fit into that basic functionality model. And that maybe that's something that um, you're not 100% sure of what, how to, what to do. Naturally, because we haven't covered it yet. All right, so I kind of got that sense. That one, one, a few weeks ago when I asked for the one-minute paper, someone said that. Like, yeah, I get everything we're doing, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do some of the stuff that's in my project. And that's a very, very, very fair observation. All right, so I'm going to kind of assume that's true. And so the next few classes, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, some of the more uh, involved data models and interactions on pages with data models and so on. So that's what that's what we're going to to look at. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that simply giving a solution where you have tables that can, people can enter and enter information, retrieve information, update, delete. Just being able to do that to a set of tables does not make an application. All right? Applications, again, take that raw data and put it in a form that's usable. All right? So you need the ability to combine data, uh, show header detail. What I mean by header detail is you might show a student and a list of all their courses. That's what I mean by header detail. That here's a student, you know, Mary Smith. This is her email address. This is where she lives. And here's a list of all her courses. And you can click a button to add a course for her and so on. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I mean about having more involved uh, stuff in the database. All right? So I found a good tutorial that we're going to go over. And to at least start, we're going to work on it together. And maybe at a certain point, uh, will, you know, it, instead of having a lecture, you, you know, you work on part of this tutorial because it, it is sort of long. I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to take, but uh, <laughs> that's sort of my plan for today. And then we'll sort of see what, what's up going forward. So let me log on. Pull up the tutorial.
All right. Uh, one thing that we haven't done too much in this class is review the, the, the jargon and the terminology. I've mentioned some things and so on, and they've been in the tutorials, but it is important. Uh, you know, you can learn how to do stuff without knowing the names for it, all right? But the problem with that is it's, they can't communicate on a resume or in a job interview. So we are doing razor pages, which I think we all know. And we are using the Entity Framework Core. So we're using ASP.NET Core. We're using uh, Razor Pages, and we're using the Entity Framework Core. The Entity Framework Core is the whole deal which we've been doing of defining the models, all right, and uh, creating a database from the models, all right, we and and then interacting to the database or interacting with the database, not necessarily by issuing SQL commands, but by issuing commands to the core model stuff. And that's reflected in the database. So I'm going to like skip ahead. Prerequisites, I think we have all this down. Sample app. and so on. Follow the link at the top of the page to get the source code for the completed project. Let's do that. stuff. figure that out after it downloads. It did download. So, ASP.NET EF intro samples. Okay. Just to preview this, this is a. Uh, this includes um, 
three um, three uh, entities, basic entities in it. It includes the student entity. And notice what we have here in the model. We have something a little different than before. We have a collection for one of these things. All right? In other words, what this is saying is that a student has a collection of enrollments. All right? An enrollment is defined as that a student is enrolled in a particular class. So that's represented this way in the model. All right? They call this a navigation property. A navigation property holds other entities related to this entity. All right? Remember that this is not a example of, this is not violating the rules of normalization by saying we have a collection here. This is a model. This is not a database table. So therefore, this is permissible. And it sets up a foreign key between the two. The enrollment entity then will have this information and will have navigation properties of the student and the course. This is still chugging along. Likewise, the course entity has a connection to enrollments. In other words, enrollment, the relationship between student and enrollments is a many-to-many -many relationship. I'm sorry, the relationship between students and courses is a many-to-many -many relationship. One student can have many course, a given course can have many students. And the thing that resolves that is the enrollments table. And you notice when we define the course here in the model, we get that. So we have these three entities, course, enrollment, and students. And we have the relationship that there's a one-to-many between course and enrollments. There is a one-to-many between student and enrollments. In other words, there's a many-to-many -many between course and student, and that is resolved by the enrollment table. I think when we're doing this, we're actually downloading all the examples for these tutorials. So if you do this, it might be good to like keep these off to the side. Don't just don't delete the ones that you're not interested in right now. All right, because you might need them later. So even though they there there's a lot of stuff and it takes up a lot of space, uh, you know, uh, take the one that you need, put it somewhere special and then keep the rest of them on standby in case you need one of the other tutorials. So here we are. Now, I'm going to follow the path to that tutorial, which it is in ASP.NET Core, data, and so on. So, data, <coughs> EFRP, intro, 
samples. And the CU one is the one that they said is the 3.0 version of the core. So that's the one I'm going to copy. All right. I think that's what the tutorial said. Let's go back to the beginning. Prerequisites, blah, blah, blah. To run the app after completing, delete the three files in one folder that have SQLite in the name. Build that. The CU3 folder. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, so this is the one I'm interested in. I'm going to copy it. And we'll put that guy on the desktop. All right. Then we'll go and open this, and we'll run it, and hopefully we'll be able to do the stuff that we need to do. I've had the worst luck this year, this semester, with versions of things. Like incompatible versions in lab or this application needs this version, this application needs that version. I haven't gotten bit too badly in this class, but in my Akron classes I've had just the worst luck with that. All right. We're going to open this one, not the SQLite version. Got to think about it. All right, they said delete the two files and one folder that has SQLite in it. and the one folder. I'm going to go and run update ta database. for a minute. All right. Seems like it worked. All right. Let's go around and let's look at the model and all that. And, and all that. So we have our models. All right. Let's look at what each of these provide. We started out with the basics. So this is, this is the final, final version. So we might look at this instead of actually working through the tutorial. Student. Notice they make good use of the annotations, the attributes of the properties. So for last name, they set a display name, they set a length, they specify that it's required. For first name, they give a message, column first name.
enrollment date, full name. Notice with the full name, this is something that we haven't seen before. It's defined as a property, but there's not a getting set. Okay? Let's talk about that for a minute. So far, the properties we've defined, we've just said getting set. All right? What that means is that the get methods look like this. I'll go and open up Notepad++. Some of you have had my Java classes and, and might be familiar with how we do get and set methods in, in Java. C Sharp just sort of provides you a shortcut. Typically, a get method is like this. Let's say I have a property int in a class. I have a property private int. Oh, let's make a string. String. First name. All right. Our get property, our get method, if we were writing this in Java, or if we were doing it the long way in C Sharp, would look like this. Public string get first name. And it would simply return the value of first name. All right. And the set method would look like this. I can't type. Let's just look at the property itself. They allow us to define a property like this. What that really means is behind the scene, these methods are generated. Okay? Has, have you gone over this in any classes yet? Do you cover this in the intro to C-sharp or advanced C-sharp? I think they go over it, but not very detailed. Okay. And again, you can, you can do this without understanding this, but I do think it's important to understand it. All right? Um, really, when you declare this like that, you're generating these methods, okay? And when you do this, when you do that in C sharp, you're really doing this. You're calling the set method. All right? So that's what those property declarations mean. All right? It's funny because some people, because we do C-sharp first and then go to Java, 
people are sometimes a little confused, like, why do we have to do this? Well, you have to do this because C-sharp does it for you, all right? C-sharp allows you to treat object references sort of like, allows you to treat everything sort of like a primitive, where you can say this equals that, all right? Whereas in reality, you're calling a set function on it. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that if you have something like this, Notice there's no code for that get or set function. The reason for that is these are functions are like template code, right? <coughs> if you have a simple property, these functions are going to be identical all the time. The set is going to take the argument and set the property. The get is going to return the property. There's like no thought. In fact, that's one of the criticisms of Java is that you have to go through and you have to define all those by hand. And sure, it's not hard. You're copying and pasting a lot of stuff, but it's still a little tedious. And C-sharp sort of frees you for that. But let's then take it to the next step. What if I have something that's a property that really is what we would call sometimes a derived property? In other words, full name. All right, what is someone's full name? It's their first name plus their last name. All right, first name plus last name. Are we going to store that as a property in the database? No, we store the first name, we store the last name as a property in the database. And we can figure out, if we know the first name and the last name, we can always generate the full name simply by concatenating them. But we might, for convenience sake, might want to treat it sort of like as a property so that we could just say, well, here, on this page we want to see last name, on this page we want to see full name. Okay? So we want to treat it like a property. Hey, we want to be able to read that. But we're never going to set it because we're going to set the first name and the last name individually. We're never going to set the full name. So that's a read-only property. Another example of that would be age, all right? Let's say we store in the database and we store, have as a property the birth date, all right? Now, would we need to store the age as well as a property? No. If you know someone's birth date, you could calculate their age, all right? But for convenience sake, we might want to have that as a derived property, or a read-only property, where there's a get and no set. And the get isn't simply returning an attribute, but it's doing some sort of calculation. If we had, if we were keeping track of uh, lots of land, plan, uh, plots of land, and we had the dimensions of it, we might not want to have the area as a property, but we might want it as a read-only property. So that's what they did here for the full name. They're going to treat it like it's a property, but it doesn't have the default get and set. It has a get that looks like this. Concatenate the last name, a comma, and the first and middle name. And then finally, as we said before, every student has a collection of enrollments. <coughs> All right? So that's the student model. Database. Because remember, the model, <coughs> how do I want to put this? The model is what we are using in our software. There's a mapping, there's a correspondence between this and how it gets implemented in the database. So let's take a look and see how these things get mapped in the database. So let's go to view SQL Server Object Explorer. Let's 
let's find our database. And let's look at the student table. Last name, first name, enrollment date. Okay? Now, let's look at the discrepancies or I don't want to say discrepancies, because a discrepancy is a problem, right? Let's look at the differences between the model and the database, and let's explain them, all right? In the database, there's four fields, ID, last name, first name, and enrollment. In the model, there's an ID, okay, that rings up, right? There's a last name, that rings up right. There is a first mid name, but the database column is called first name. That annotation says, okay, we call it first mid name in the, bot, in the, in the model, but in the database call it first name. I don't know why you do that, by the way. All right, it seems confusing, but this is an example that shows you, yeah, you can do that. You could call something one thing in your model and call it something else in the database. Enrollment date, that was there. Was there anything called full name in the database? No. We just had last name, first name, enrollment date, and ID. Why? Well, because there's no set value for that. So it is a derived property, all right, a read-only property. It's calculated from the values of the other properties. And then finally, I collection of enrollments. Are there any enroll is there any enrollments in the student table? No. The enrollments are in a separate table that have a student ID. Enrollment ID, course ID, student ID, and grade. And we can see that in the enrollment model. Notice the enrollment model. The enrollment model has Four properties, and then two kind of other kinds of properties. If we look at the enrollment table, <coughs> enrollment ID, course ID, student ID, and grade. If we look at the enrollment model, those four are there, but also there are course and student. That is describing the relationship. So when you see a property that is not a primitive, all right, course is not a primitive, student is not a primitive, right? Those are other members of the model. When you see that, all right, that defines a relationship between the entities in the model. So if we were to look at the database for enrollment, we'll see that there are two foreign keys, one for student and one for course. Does that make sense? So the course and the student <coughs> point to are telling this model to point to the course table and the student table, or the course model and the student model. Remember, the model is sort of conceptually how everything is seen within our application. We have to take that model and store it in a relational database. We can't have a column in our relational database for student, right? 
but we can have a foreign key from the student ID of the enrollment table to the student ID in the course uh, in the student table. Likewise with the course. All right, let's preview the other stuff in the model. We did course, we did enrollment. Oh, we did student, rather. We did enrollment. Let's look at course. Title, credits, department ID, foreign key to department. So let's look at the department model. We see those fields. That include a foreign key to courses, an instructor, that's an administrator, all right, it means that there's a foreign key between this and the instructor table. I don't know what this is for. We'll have to figure that out later. And the rest of the stuff is pretty well set. Now. Why is there a question mark here? What does that question mark represent? It can be no. It can be no. All right. So in other words, all right, what that is saying is there's an administrator for this department. So like the person that's the head of the department. But it's not required that every department have a head. That's what that is telling us. Yes, there is a relationship between this table, the department table, and the instructor table. But because the instructor ID is optional, that is, it can be null, all right, that is not required. So there can be departments without a administrator. Compare that to what we have in the enrollment table. No question mark there. All right. In other words, this table is required for every row in this table to have a course ID and a student associated with it. It's not just a foreign key, it's a required foreign key. Okay, so there's Let's see, we went over a course, department, enrollment, student. Let's look at instructor. Instructor has, of course, an ID, name, name, hire date, full name, another read-only <coughs> property, a collection of courses that they're assigned to, and then an office assignment. The office assignment then has instructor ID, office location, and it refers to the instructor table. So notice it's not just enough to have the IDs. I think that's what I was doing mistakenly last time. You have to put that there is a relationship between the entities down here. Uh, finally, course assignment. Course assignment is like uh, enrollment except is for instructors. All right. So that's the model and the model and the database. It's important to see how the model and the database connect.
to each other. So far in the examples we gave, it was very much a one-to-one -one sort of thing. What we put in the model showed up in the database. Now we're improving our models to show the relationships between entities and not just the entities themselves. How do we show a relationship? So example, how do we show the relationship between course assignment and instructors? Well, we have a instructor ID in the course assignment table. We have then an instructor object in the course assignment table. These primitives are what get stored in the database. These things are only in the model. So if we look at the database again for this course assignment, we see that it only has the two fields, instructor and course ID. The instructor ID points to an uh, instructor, and that is what we have in the course assignment model. The fact that, yeah, associated with this course, there is an instructor who is pointed to by the instructor ID. All right, let's run this guy and see if it works. Let's sort of take a tour of the application. Oh, you don't know how happy I am that that didn't blow up. All right. So here's our about. All right. I don't know what this is. We can find out. All right. Let's just take a tour of this and observe, and we'll come back and take a, a look at it. Notice this very much looks like the template, right? Now, they're allowed to do this because they're making tutorials and they want to focus on one thing at a time. We want our pages to look, we want you to take the time, for example, on your project especially, to take the time and remember everything that you learned about web design and do a good job designing and developing your pages. So that means put in good CSS. All right, students. All right three students enrolled at these particular dates. There's a search. I assume it's on last name. It is. Edit, details, delete. Notice it doesn't have any login in this, which probably you would have. You would not want someone to be able to go in to your website and make changes to it without being authorized. There's actually two levels of authorization. You can, you, can, you can log people on, and then you can assign different permissions based on what their user role is. We've covered the first part of it. Depending on how the semester goes, we might look at the second part of it uh, later on. All right, we can edit. This is basically the same old scaffolding stuff that we've seen so far. Details. But notice that now the details shows the course enrollment. Okay? So they're a little bit different than what we have done. All right? So far. We have, in our details, we have had just the details from the, t from the one table. They have the details from the one table along with the enrollments. So that's pretty cool. And then delete, we're not going to do that. Course. There's a list of courses. Edit. Department. There's a drop down for. We've done that so far. Details. delete. It would be great if when we clicked on this, we saw maybe the professor that was assigned to it. 
or maybe the list of students that were in this course. We can possibly look at adding that functionality um, later on. All right, instructors. Notice that this shows the name of the office that they're in, and it also shows their course or courses that they're teaching right on the listing. All right. So remember, these three fields are the fields that are actually in the instructor table. All those are in the model, right? But these are the ones in the table. This is from the offices table, and this is from the course assignment and course table. We go and edit. Ah, we have a lot of fun here, right? We can actually assign an office, and we can assign courses and then save. So this is, a ta this is an edit screen that allows us to edit um, multiple tables at the same time. We're editing one entity as far as our model is concerned. But remember that that entity maps to a bunch of stuff in the database. Okay? And finally, departments, shows the administrator if there is one, shows the row version, whatever that is. And so on. Okay. Questions of what we've seen so far. What I really want to focus on is we focused on the model and how the model maps to the database. And we focused on the things that are different in the model, in this example, from the models that we've been used to seeing so far. Now I want to do sort of the same thing with these pages. And I'm going to start with the About page, because that one intrigues me. All right. Enrollment date students. Bless you. What table do you suppose this comes from? Or what table is a wrong statement? I, I have to get with the times, as you young people would say. All right. Model. Entity. What entity do you think in the model do you think that this relates to? Courses. I would think that it relates to the enrollment entity. Which, if we look at the enrollment entity, you're right. There's courses in there. But specifically, they're looking when students are enrolled. So they're looking for the date of students and what the, the enrollment the enrollment date comes from the student because <coughs> that has the enrollment date and then for every student that enrolled I'll bet you it's counting the number of courses that they have enrolled so let's look at the about page and let's find the about page first We'll take a look at how that is done. Okay, so about. This is one thing that we haven't explicitly talked about either. But, again, this would be something good for us to cover at some point. Notice the URL, localhost about. How does that get turned into an actual web page name? Where am I going to find this web page? Let's look at students. This is slash students. 
This is slash about. This is slash courses. Well, first of all, all our pages are in this pages folder. Well, most of them are. The about is here. All right. So if we look at about, we can see where it comes from. We can look at the model. And our query, we've seen queries before, right, in this on get async. This one's a little different, though, because we're grouping students. All right. And we're getting a count for those students. All right. So this is a statement that essentially counts, that joins the students and the enrollment and then returns a count. From student, group students by enrollment date into date group, select new date group, enrollment date is the group key, and student count is that, and then we return the data. So maybe this doesn't use the enrollment table. Maybe just use the student table. All right. Let's look at, next, let's look at the student page. What did I want to look at on the student page? <coughs> When we look at the details, because again, we show on the details the related information from the enrollment and course table. So, let's look at the student details page. First of all, let's look at the model. Grabbing all the students, we're then joining it to the enrollments, and then we're joining that to the courses. Okay? And we're doing that for the specific ID that we want. We've done that before. We've seen that before, remember. Uh, the ID is an optional argument to this page. And so effectively what we're doing is we're grabbing the first student that has this ID. Hint, hint, there's only going to be one, right, because it's the primary key. And it's unique. So we're going to grab the student that has the ID. And we're going to match them up with their enrollment data and their, and going to match the enrollment data up with 
the course data. Okay? Notice that we don't like say where key equals key or anything like that. Why not? Because the model handles that for us. The model knows that this is how those two things are linked, so therefore that's what we're going to do. If we then look at the details page itself, top part of it looks the same. We have our loop. We're displaying the data from the student. We're then looping through every item, every enrollment. And for every enrollment, we're displaying the course title and the grade. So we're actually throw, showing data across three tables uh, in here. The student. And then for the student, we're pulling all the enrollments, and for each enrollment, we'll, we're pulling the particular class. And we're showing the title from the course and the grade from the enrollment. What I plan, let's see what time it is. This is a good place to stop, I think. I will zip up this version of it and upload it to save you the pain of downloading all those stuff, uh, all that stuff. And then uh, next time what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these other differences and we're going to then go in and implement some of these sorts of changes in this application, if that makes sense. For example, I don't think the department showed the list of teachers. Well, we're going to add the list of teachers to the department details page or, or whatever. Whatever isn't implemented, we'll go and we'll add that piece of, of code in there. So questions? All right. Good place to stop. Uh, you have a little bit of extra time, lab time today. Remember, you need to show me your stuff for me to grade it. All right. I say that a lot. And again, a lot of people have. Good job on you for that. A lot of people have not, which I will grade. I'm not saying I won't grade it if you don't come up to me and show it to me. But I, I, every time I intend to do it, I keep getting delayed. So if you come to me in lab, that guarantees you'll get timely feedback. All right. See you in lab.